So I'll, uh, I'll do that again. All right, Don't we are. Tomorrow. Right, 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 tomorrow night, midnight. Yeah. Yeah, last thing is the AP class and just you can practice exam free and then we'll go over any questions. Which one? It's all different. Yeah, it's over. Yeah. What I did, guys, just to make life easy, because so many people are out with AP tests and everybody's everybody's getting jammed up. I get it. So I reopened everything and everything is due by like like get it done before Friday, obviously, because it's gonna help you for the AP test. Um and if you're not taking any of this, get it done anyway because it'll help you for the final. Um, so what I'm thinking, so yeah, we're gonna go over these questions on Thursday. So what I wanna do Thursday, we have a double period Thursday, so that'll give us a chance to like tie up loose ends, go over some like questions that you guys have. We'll hit these multiple choice questions, we'll figure them out together, um, and just make sure we're all set, and then just kind of wrap things up and be ready to go, okay? And that's it, we're there. I'm excited. I'm so going to lame this morning. I said I haven't felt this confident about the AP test in a couple of years. So. I have to say I'm not that confident. Really? No, you're going to so, do well. There's so much material. You are shooting for. I don't, yeah, I know you're shooting shoot for the five. So that puts more pressure on you. But I think you're going to do well. I feel very prepared. Yeah, if you've done the work, honestly, like it's so funny. My first year teaching, I'm not forget, Nate Rayner, who's Clint Rayner's brother, I had him. And. We walked in, you know, I'm like 23 years old. I'm like, all right, guys, you know, I'm like four years older than them. So it's like, you know, I'm like their brother, you know. And I said, I'm like, I'm like, Nate, like, how do you feel about this thing? And he goes, you know, I did all the work. He was like a 40-year-old man back then. He's like, I did all the work. I did everything I was supposed to do. He goes, I got this. He goes, that's how it is. He goes, if you did it all, you should be fine. And I'm like, it's a good idea. You know, he got a five. You know, I'm like, he did it all. So, um, yeah, so really, honestly, if you've been doing the work, you know, and you've been pushing through it, and remember, you don't have to get a high score. You don't have to get, like, a perfect score. You don't need, a, like, a 90 to do well on this, right? 80, 85% correct, get you that five, you know? On 70, choice or on, on everything, the whole thing. So the whole test, you know? Um, and you guys know how to strategize for and stuff? On the left, on the left. You're, that's, you're in a solid four range. Yeah, you got me. Yeah. So, and you know, the day of the test, you never know. Like, things, things pop in, it's just, it's... You know, it's all different too. You know, like you're in a different frame of mind when you do the practice test versus the actual test. The adrenaline's pumping, you're a little more, you know, aware of what's going on. So it changes. It's just it's different. So it's a good thing. Go ahead. How long is the actual test? Like how long is three hours. hours. So you have ninety minutes to do the first part. So you do sixty questions in the equivalent of a double period. Okay. And then you take a break and you do the free response in the same time period. Um, it's two essays and, and four short response. I don't understand why yeah. tests are so long. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's the whole aura of AP and the advanced placement and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. so we'll go over that. Hour. Hour, and hour. hour and a half tests. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So I want to just show you guys a couple of things. Um, one thing I want to do is I gave you guys a copy of the formula sheet. I just want you to be familiar with, aware with, aware of the formula sheet, what it looks like. Um, I know we talked about it and I've been throwing pieces of it up there, but they did change it from a couple of years back. It's actually simpler. Um, and just where to find the stuff. Like it's all about just being efficient, right? So, um, and there are formulas on here that you really have, like standard deviation. They're not going to make you calculate that. I still don't know why that's on there. Mean is just, that's average. So like, this is like all this crazy stuff, but you know how to do an average, right? Um, and here's your chi square, which is probably the trickiest one. Okay. It's the sum of all of your O minus E squared over E. So, and I'm going to do chi squared with you guys today, too. We're going to look at a big one just to make sure you're set. Here's your degrees of freedom. There's your chi squared table. And over here is where they tell you what everything is. They tell you what your degrees of freedom are, right? Go ahead. Can you go over with null hypothesis? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Yep, that's all part of chi squared. Absolutely. Um, what the sum is observed and expected. And then you have your Hardy-Weinberg equation here. They lay it out for you. They tell you what P and Q equal. Okay. Um, probability. We're going to hit this. This is where the mutually exclusive thing um, or mutually independent. Um, so this is the one where in genetics, you know, they ask you what's the probability that, you know, like, for example, you have, I have two kids, right? Um, so what's the probability that if I have another kid um, that all three of my children will have type O blood? And it would be, you know, 50% times 50% times 50%. Right, but I'll do that with you guys. We'll do a couple of those. Good. How do we know if they're independent 
of each other or if they play off of each other? Um, in genetics, they're always independent because they're not related to each other at all. It's based on your punnett square. So if, for each child, there's a 50% chance. What they would say is, what would be the chance that either or all of them would have it? And that would be your independent one. Okay? Um, mode, medium, range, they just give us these definitions. They give you the preferences. You remember what they mean. Okay, so this is just to kind of help you with definitions and such. Um, this page, rate is change in Y or change in X, right? It's a change in um, the amount of change over the time, okay, which is, you know, you've done that before. The growth of a population is its birth rate minus its death rate. This D, little dt, that's your change in time. It's almost always one year. So since that's always over one, D minus D is equal to your uh, your change in the population size. Okay, exponential growth is the change in the population multiplied by um, R max, which they give you. And then this is the same thing, except now you have to include your carrying capacity. Okay, again, you fill these in. Simpson's diversity index, we haven't had a question on this yet. So who knows if they're even going to ask it. But again, you just plug in the numbers. If they tell you the number of organisms in a certain species versus the total number of all species, you divide that by each other and multiply. Um, sorry, and you get the sum of this, so however many species you have, so they explain it. Um, but that's it. I've never seen a question on this, so don't panic. Um, water potential, they give you everything right here. Okay, they tell you what the formula is, what everything stands for. They give you the solute potential, right? Negative I CRT, and they tell you what everything means. So it's all there for you. Okay. And then if you have to do surface area to volume ratio, these are your surface areas of your different shaped cells, and those are the volumes. Go ahead, John. Water potential is the ability to give water, not take it. It's the ability to gain. Yeah. So it's it's the solution's ability to, to, to gain water from another solution. So always goes down its gradient, right? Goes from less negative to the more negative potential. Okay. All right. But I just want to show this to you guys so you see where it is, keep it. You're going to get two copies of this, one for the first part, one for the second part. Um, and so it's part of your test. You can go back to it and reference it. Again, in years past, there were some years where they never used a formula sheet. So who knows if that's going to be the case. I doubt it because now that they, it seems that they wanted to put more pi square on there. Potty Warnberg is going to be on there. So I, I suspect you're going to have to use it a little bit more. But there were some years where... They, like they asked you to do like an average and read a graph and come up with a slope and that was it. And it was like very basic. So hopefully that's the same the case this year. We'll see. Um, they're probably using last year's exam for this year because it was, it's all been written already. So they probably just have to change the dates and stuff. Okay. But I want you to see, just so you kind of know, like, okay, that's the formula sheet. Um, we didn't really use it completely this year because what I did is I put the formulas on the test for you guys rather than giving you the separate formula sheet. So, but it's all there. It's the same stuff, um, but now it's all together, okay? Um, so let's talk genetics. Okay, so yesterday we talked about um, some of the key things that they get at, like independent assortment, right, is when you have a dihybrid cross and the alleles assort independently of each other, okay? And, whoop, sorry about that. And as a review, you always get a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio on that, right? So we're always going to see 9 sixteenths, 3 sixteenths, 3 sixteenths, 1 sixteenths. And that's the breakdown that you get. This would be an example of numbers that would match that. So if they gave you a population and you saw this, and you'll see it when we do some of the, the practice questions in a few minutes, um, that that would tell you it's a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. And this means that the alleles are not linked. They're not on the same chromosome, right? So that means that they're free to assort independently. If they are linked, you're going to wind up getting... The same kind of outcomes, but the numbers are going to be different, right? Question, guys. Yeah, I'm confused because I remember yesterday you said they might change the order of the numbers. Yeah, so what they might do is put tall brown and short white here, and then have these two like this on the bottom. So, like, these two would just be lower. So don't always look for them to be in the middle. Like, they may just be down here. That's it all. Be a, a pattern, but it doesn't matter. Right. What you're going to see is two, two groups that look like either parent, which make up the overwhelming majority of the offspring, and then two groups that are a very small number. And you'll see that. I'm going to show you guys in like a couple of minutes. We can go through some of the questions, right? This means they're linked. And remember that to figure out the percent crossover, you just take these two numbers and sum them up and then divide it by the total, right? So like yesterday, this was 13%. And so that tells you that they cross over really infrequently, right? That means that they're close to each other, okay? 
But this tells you that these are linked genes. When you see this type of ratio, they're unlinked, okay? And they independently assort, okay? which means that there are two different chromosomes. And that's, thankfully, Gregor Mendel, when he did this, he just happened to pick alleles that could do that. If he picked alleles that were linked, he'd have a mess. It wouldn't work for him. So fortunately, that's how we got that, okay? Um, and so that's independent assortment, right? And then after that, I just want to see. Sex-linked traits, that's what I want to get to. Okay, so with sex-linked traits, um, the way that you can determine, it's either called sex-linked or X-linked. So let's do, let me just change my color here. Okay. So sex-linked, also known as X-linked traits. Okay. These are carried on the, they're inherited on the X chromosome, right? Okay. And generally when you see this type of inheritance, males tend to have a greater chance of picking these up if they're recessive, okay? So most of them are recessive, right? Um, and so the recessive ones are things like color blindness, Um, hemophilia and muscular dystrophy. Okay. So those are the recessive ones. Okay. And so if they're recessive, that means that for a female, she needs to have two recessive alleles in order to be effective. Right. So a normal female can be this. So she has no expression of the trait, okay? But if she's hybrid, she still doesn't express it, right? But she's known as a carrier, right? So she can pass that trait on to her offspring, but she herself is not affected because she has a dominant allele. So with colorblindness, hemophilia, and muscular dystrophy, a female can carry a recessive allele for this, but not be affected. In order for a female to be affected, she has to have both recessives, okay? So she needs two recessives to be effective, okay? So the chance of a female having these diseases is lower because she needs to have both of these, okay? For males, you either have it or you don't. You're either normal or affected, right? You cannot have a carrier male. Right. They can never be a, um, a carrier. Okay. Um, the other thing that we see with sex link traits, that. Just to be clear, um, yep. so carrier isn't just whether they have the allele or not. It's only if they have one of the allele but don't express it. Correct. Exactly. It's an asymptomatic carrier. Right. So they have they, they carry the trait but don't express it. Got it. Okay. Now, yep. Got it. If they're this, can you go over the on the soft? Autosomal? Yeah. Yep. I'm going to go. Yeah, definitely. That's actually related to this. Actually, let me tell you right now. Sex link is always carried on an X chromosome. Autosomal is anything but a sex chromosome. So autosomal is going to be a disease that's carried on any of the normal somatic body chromosomes, where both males and females can either be, you know, homozygous dominant, hybrid, or recessive. Okay. So it's just like a regular Right. It's like regular genes, like, you know, eye color, hair color, stuff like that. The difference between them is males only carry one allele, right? Mm -hmm. Because they don't have two set, two X chromosomes. So it's almost like it's like a blank, right? Where autosomal, everybody has two alleles, right? So they can either have two dominant, two recessive, or they could both be hybrid, right? So basically for sex-linked traits, males can never be a hybrid, right? You can never have a hybrid male, okay? Um, so for example, in some examples of this, uh, let's do eye color. Right, this tends to work in fruit flies. Okay, so if you cross fruit flies, right, um, eye color is, is sex linked most of the time, unless they tell you otherwise. So if you have a female who has, let's do it this way. Let's say you have a female who is uh, 
recessive for red eyes. So she has two white eye alleles, right? So big R equals red, little r equals white, right? So here's a female, she's got white eyes, right? You're going to cross her with a male that has red eyes, okay? What's going to happen is the eye color is going to appear to flip genders, right? So in the second generation, when you do this, right, if you cross a red-eyed male with a white-eyed female, all of your females now have red eyes. Using the wrong letter, sorry. And all of the males get the white eye trait because they always inherit their X chromosome from their mother, right? So whatever the mother has as her X chromosomes, the males get that, okay? And then. Whatever the male father has for his X chromosome gives that to the females. So here we started off with white females, red males, and now in this F1 generation, it's red-eyed females, white-eyed males. You see how it flipped? Okay. So that's the first hint, like that tells you that oh, this might be sexlink. Okay. Um, another cool thing with sexlink traits is based on the males, you can determine the female's genotype. Right. So if you have a cross. And half of your males have red eyes, and half of your males have white eyes. What does that tell you about the mother? She's hybrid. Yeah, she's hybrid, right? Because if you have 50-50 on the males, that means that that female had to have half dominant and half recessive. Okay. So what's kind of neat about this is your, your offspring can tell you not only what the parents were, but what specific gender had what particular characteristic, right? Um, and if any of your females came out white, right, let's say you had a white-eyed female, what does that tell you about the male? The dad. So, yeah, so if this one comes out white, that means that the dad had to also have white eyes, right? And so what this gives you is... Half of your offspring are red-eyed, and half of them are white-eyed. And that's because the mom is hybrid, and the dad had this little R up here. Okay? So just those are like little hints, right? When you see things flipping, like if they give you a question, you're like, I can't tell if this is you know, sex-linked or autosomal. If they're talking about males and females, and you see that in one generation, the males have one eye color, the females have another, and then in the next generation, it seems to flip, right? It becomes opposite. That tells you it's sex-linked, okay? We're excellent. Okay. Are we all right with that? Okay. And the last piece with this is cats. Um, cats that have fur color, right? The calico cats. This is an example of both X linkage and cogominance, right? Right? In cats, um, you can either have black or orange, right? And they're both codominant, so they're both expressed equally. Right? Remember that whole equal expression thing? You get like a blending of both colors, right? So for calico cats, if you have a female with two B alleles, she's black, right? If she's got two O alleles, she's orange, right? And if she's got a black and an orange, now she's got both of these expressed. She's calico, right? Males can never be calico. How come? They only have one X. Yeah, they have the one X. Right. Yep. So a male can either be black or orange, and that's it, right? So if half of if you have cats and half of the males come out black and half come out orange, what does that tell you about the mother? Right, mystery potted square. So yeah, so if half of your males are black and half of your males are orange, that means that the mom had to be codominant, right? Because she's always going to pass her X chromosomes onto the males, okay? So with sex linked traits, the male phenotype and genotype is dictated by the female, okay? And then 
the female genotype is dictated by both the mom and the dad, right? So how is it possible that these two can have, you could have calico, let's see if I can erase this, yeah. You'd have calico off from here. Could you? Right, what would the male have to be? Does it matter? Now, the male could either be orange or black. So if he's a black male, right, you'll have a black female and calico down here, right? And if it's an orange male, you'll have calico and orange. So, see that? Okay. All right, we'll do it some time. All right, so let's do a couple of these questions and let's let's play around. Oh, um, chi square. That's the other thing. So let's do some of the chi square things. So I gave you guys two copies of these yesterday. Right? One is a thin packet that's got the chi-square right on it, and then the other one's got these pedigrees. Yeah, I gave you this one today, and then some people I gave you yesterday, right? And then we'll do the, the chi-square ones, a little thinner packet, right? So we'll take a look at the chi-square ones. You guys at home, I have, um, these are all on Schoology. So they're in this exam review 2020. So I have the review Chi Square and review Mendelian. So we're going to do these. We're going to work out of these really like the rest of the day today, right? So most of these Chi Square questions are the multiple choice that popped up. You know, who knows if these are from this year or last year or whatever, right? Do you need a copy of it? It's got the it's got this chart on it, right? Yeah. Yesterday. Yeah. It's not a half point. I don't know why I don't have to. Oh, wait. Got it? All right, cool. All right. So, the null hypothesis. All right. So, the null hypothesis is the hypothesis at which states that there is no statistical significance in your data, right? So, whatever results you got, the difference is the result of just randomness. It's random chance. It's the acceptable randomness of like 5% error, right? So when you're doing something like this, like for example, this one, you have observed numbers and you have expected numbers, right? What chi-square tells you is, is this deviation from what we expected significant or is it insignificant? And it's just, you know, what you would expect to be your standard normal range of error that you would have, okay? So to do this, you do this whole calculation thing of your observed minus your expected, right? And then you square that and you divide that by all of your observed values. Right. So in this first question here, um, they told you the whole thing with the calico cats and they said, OK, you know, we took um, we took a, a calico female cat and made it with an orange male cat. Right. And they produced this in the F1. Right. Now, they expected to get even distribution. Right. So out of, you know, 30, 40 kittens, that's a lot of cats. But, um, you know, they expected that equal amounts of each color offspring, right? This is what they actually got, okay? And so when they did their chi-square, right, they calculated um, a chi-square value of 4.6, okay? And they chose a significance level of P equals 0.5. So what does that mean? Okay, well, first you have to go to the table in your reference chart. So when you go to your reference table, okay, this is what we're looking at, okay? And degrees of freedom is the number of outcomes that you get minus one. So in that case, they had four different phenotypes, right? So out of those four phenotypes, you say, okay, degrees of freedom, four minus one, it's three, right? Now you go to your chi-square table, okay? And you say, okay, you're always going to use the top row, 0.05. Unless they tell you otherwise, you always use 95% confidence, right? Which is a 0.05 variant, right? So we have three degrees of freedom. So our critical value is 7.81, okay? Now we go back to that question, right? They calculated their chi square of 4.6. So 4.6 is below 7.81. If you hit that critical value or exceed it, that means you have to reject your null hypothesis. So since we're, we're below, this number is below what's in that table, the null hypothesis is valid, right? So which of these says that the null hypothesis is valid? Because it's less than a critical value. Which one? Yeah, it's D, right? So you cannot reject the null hypothesis because the chi-square value that they calculated 
is less than the critical value in that table. Okay? All right? So let's do a couple of chi-square things. Let me actually flip back here for a second. And I want to borrow something here. Let's see. Uh, Yeah, let's do this one. These are actually from, I like this one. Let me do this one first. Let me just, let me switch this up a bit. Actually, yeah, we'll do this together. Because this makes it totally understandable. I like this question. All right, go here. Oh, look, it's right here. I had a few guys. Okay. So this was a multiple choice question from, I forgot which example one it was. This, you got to come across this at some point. Right? So they gave you this multiple choice, right? And they said, okay, you don't have this, so just, but we're going to, oh, oh, oh. they don't have this, so we're going to just do this together, right? And just think about it, and then we're going to write stuff up to show you, right? So they said, okay, they, they did this whole thing where they said, okay, flower color has two different alleles. Big R is dominant, and little R is recessive, right? And so they took snapdragon plants, and they said, we believe that they're going to be in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Which means that, why? What did Hardy Weinberg mean about alleles? They're going to what? It means allele frequencies never change, right? So they should stay the same generation after generation, right? That was that whole thing with the Hershey Kisses when we did that lab. And the whole idea was, okay, we started off 50-50, we wanted to end off 50-50, right? Right? Well, in this case, they started off like this, right? And they predicted that if they're in Hardy Weinberg, how should they end? The same, right? So after seven generations, they should get the same numbers. Well, they didn't, right? So the question is, the variation that they got here, is that just randomness, or is there a significance to those variations? Like, are these numbers off? Like, this is a pretty big number here. Is that enough that, hey, maybe something's going on in the environment with our plants, right? So they did a chi-square analysis, right? And I'm going to show you how to actually set it up. But they said... Assuming the researchers use a significance level of 0.05, what is the critical value that they should be using from the chart? So how many um, phenotypes do we have here? How many outcomes do we have? Three, right? So what's our degrees of freedom? Two. So this is basically asking you to look at the table and say what the critical value is for two degrees of freedom. That's all they're asking. Right? So what is it? 5.99, right? So this should be 5.99, right? So now the question that you guys are asking is, well, how do you set up a chi-square? So here's our answer, right? So how do we do the chi-square? All right, so I'm going to show you this. Um, this is not what you'd have to do to answer this problem, but I want to show you what the chi-square is on this. Because I was kind of interested, like, are these really off or not? Like, how close are they? Right, you got it. Okay, 5.99 came from looking at the, 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 the formula sheet. So what you do is you go to that table that says uh, chi-square table, right? And then what you do is you say, okay, I have three different colors here, right? So three different colors means it's two degrees of freedom, right? Because the number of outcomes you have, you subtract one from that. And then you look at your degrees of freedom in the table, and you look for two, right? And then you look at the p-value of 0.05, and you look at the critical value underneath that. So underneath two, it's 5.99. Yeah. Did you get it? Yeah. You're good? All right. All right. So I'm going to show you guys how to set this up. Yeah, we got time. Okay. So to make a chi-square table, it's really not difficult. Um, first, you need to have a spot for your outcomes, right? So we know we have three outcomes, right? So we have red, we have pink, and white, right? So those are our three outcomes. And we have to look at, okay, what did we observe, right? And this is what we expected, okay? And then we take the difference between those, and then we take that difference and square it, and then we take that difference that we squared and divide it by what we expected, okay? So that very last column is this, O minus E squared over e. And if you look at your formula sheet, the chi-square is the sum. Yeah, I messed that up. <laughs> I don't know what the heck happened there. 
I think I hesitated. Let's see. Yeah. It's the sum of this. So you're going to add up these three columns. All right. But we'll get to that. So first off, okay, what did they observe? So after seven generations, they observed these numbers, right? 39, 34, and 27. Okay. What they expected was what they had at the start, right? Because according to Hardy Weinberg, everything should stay the same, right? Hardy Weinberg says if you have no mutation, no gene flow, no selective mating, no natural selection, and the large population, allele frequency should stay the same, right? And so this should be 34, uh, 43, and 23, right? So now we say, okay, so, so we got that, right? So now you just subtract from each other, right? 39 minus 34, this is a difference of 5. This is a difference of negative 11. This is a difference of 4. Never fear the negatives, right? Because you're going to take that number and square it, right? So 5 times 5, 25, right? And then 11 times 11 is 121. And then 4 times 4 is 16, okay? So then the last number is, okay, let's take 25 and divide by the expected. Right? So 25 divided by 34, I see people do the math for me because we want to get decimals. 121 out of 43, and this is 16 out of 23. So just calculate the math so we can see what we got. Yeah, 0. 0.75. Point, which one? 0. 0.7? 0. 0.75. All right, so 0. 0.74, okay. Three point eight one. Okay. Oh, two point eight one. And then point seven. Okay, sounds cool. All right. Okay. Now add these all up. Point seven four plus two point eight one plus point seven. Let's see what we get. All right, so we calculated our chi-square as, what is it, 4.25. Okay, critical value is 5.99. So now, what does that tell us about the numbers that we got? It's random because this number is lower than that, right? So we accept or reject the null. Right, you accept the null, right? If it's below 5.99, if it's below the critical value, we accept the null. So the variation that we see here is due to chance, okay? You see how it's set up? I don't know if they're going to make you do this or not. I, they've only done it like twice in all the years I've been teaching this where they made people set up a chi-square table and calculate it. I see a lot of the multiple choice questions like this where they're asking you what's the critical value, um, what p-value should they use. Um, you know, and then actually with the other question, like they gave you everything and they wanted you to determine if you accept the null or reject it. So it seems like they don't want people to calculate this all, but they want you to understand that if you get a chi-square value and you have your critical value, if it's below that, you, ex you accept the null. If it's above that, you reject the null. Okay? Is that good? So let's go back to these multiple choice questions and let's take a look at the next one. So let's save this. Uh, yeah, here's like question two, okay? So they give you this whole story. You observe that when two plants that are heterozygous with red flowers across, you get red, white, and pink. And then they propose the null hypothesis that the color is a result of independent assortment, right? They're independently sorting and they're incompletely dominant. They got a chi-square value of 7.3. Now they tell you, assuming two degrees of freedom, which of the following is the correct interpretation of the chi-square analysis? And they give you the p-value. All right, so we're at two degrees of freedom. Uh, so what's the critical value for two degrees of freedom on that table? 5.99. Right, 5.99, right? So 5.99, they got 7.3. So what does that mean? They got 7.3. Critical value is 5.99. So they reject, right? Because now that's above the critical value, right? So we have to reject the null hypothesis. So the correct answer is one of these, right? Um, it's either A or D. And it should be which one? Oh, no. It's, it's 
Uh, right, it's A, right? The critical value, and this is again, get the names down. Critical value is what's in this chart. This is called, it's called the chi square table, but it's technically called the critical value table. Okay? So the critical value is what's in the table. Calculated value is the chi square. It's what the, the researchers came up with, right? So because what they calculated was greater than the critical value, you have to reject it. The other way of saying it, right, and this is all about semantics, is the critical value is less than the calculated value. It's the same thing. You see that? So I see a lot of where they, they're going to word it in the less than simple way, right? And so you have to just be careful and make sure that you're reading it correctly. Because these two, you read too quick, you might have the wrong thing because they're just reversing it. But instead of saying, you know, oh, you're going to reject the null hypothesis because your chi-square is greater than the critical value, they're saying you're rejecting this because the critical value is less than your chi-square. Just change the way they said it, okay? All right. All right. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll do a few more. Um, we will hit this one, and then we'll get into the um, pedigree charts. Go ahead. Is it which one? The, the one that I just did? Yeah. 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 Yep. This one. Yeah. So the reason it's this is all because of the number of degrees of freedom, right? If you have three samples, you always subtract one from the number of samples or outcomes you have. So this is two degrees of freedom, and on the chart, that two degrees is 599. These are your degrees of freedom, the numbers along the top, like one, two, three, four, five. So two degrees of freedom means you have three samples, and so the maximum that your chi-square can hit is 599. If it exceeds that, Right? If it goes over this number, that means that whatever variation we have here, there's something going on. Right? If it's less than that, like this, then you say, oh, it's the null hypothesis, which means there's no relationship in the variation that you see here. Okay. Is that better? I just, like, did you just circle five and nine and use it for the question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was, I'm trying to say, I was just looking at question 39, like, on okay. the side. Yeah. Explaining it just, just kind of weird. You got it, though? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Like, I get, I get what we're saying with like the chi, the chi square thing. Mm -hmm. but. So what they what they were asking is what was the critical value. So all they wanted you to do for this question was look at this table, and figure out which of these numbers was correct. Right. And it's based on the number of outcomes you have. So you have three outcomes. You use two degrees of freedom, and then that tells you here what your critical value is. Right? So if we use two, that's the critical value. Yeah. Let's say we have four. Like there's actually another one we're gonna do. Actually, I'll show you. There's one here. Like this has four outcomes. So you're gonna use three degrees of freedom, which means that would be your chi square value. Right. right. In order for it to be accepted, it's to be less. Right. Exactly. Got it. Yep. Yeah. That's it. Right. Sweet. Okay. Right.
some air. Is it warmer out? Does it feel warmer? Yesterday it was so cold. Even the whole building was cold.
But my brother wants me to drive him on track to go home and all the way back to Bayport and all the way back here. Oh, oh we're fine. Oh, okay. Um, it's well, Wait, what happened to Aaron? I saw blood dripping down. Mm -hmm. Like all over it. And then we, do you want to see the picture? We have a picture of her visco or something. Oh, she knows it. it. Yeah. Is there a little? Yeah, and she literally tried Oh, when that, that was that penalty? Yeah, I, mean, I don't think she got it. Yeah, but then I don't even know. Jesse got she wanted. Which it should have been, but just so cute. I've been to go to Jesse. Yeah, she was like, I 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 yeah, you guys, you can't have a tie game. Well, eventually, I guess, but we so. go into overtime and overtime again, and then the field hockey, and we went up to seven, and then, and then the wins go on. And she yeah. And it's only three minutes over time. Yeah. But, like, the I'll see you later. Well, now. Right. Sorry, I just went to go and see Miss Murphy. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. I didn't start anything yet. So. Oh, All right. I have a question for you, real quick. Can you print out the practice test after this? Because oh, yeah, yeah. I couldn't figure out. Yep. Yeah, I'll do that. Definitely. Yep. You know what? Let me. Uh, it's long. Let me print it out in the copy room and then swing by later, like before the end of the day, pick it up. Like, I'm off eighth and ninth, so I might we might have a class. Tonight, so I might what? I might leave early. Tonight. All right, so stop by me quickly because I'll send it down, and after I do this, I'll I'll send it real quick. I'll do that. All right, so there we go. I knew people would come back. All right, so here's this is one of the chi square questions that was on the um, AP classroom, and it says here, okay, proof flies. Purple eyes and ebony body, they're traits that display autosomal recessive patterns. So they're telling you that they're autosomal recessive. Right? So they're telling you that these are the recessives, right? Purple and ebony. And they're saying that normal and normal is the dominant one. Right? And so they did the whole cross. This is what they observed, this is what they expected. And so what they're asking you is: okay, the students choose a significant level of P equals 0.01. Right? So they mixed it up. So now they're using the second row of that chart. Um, which of the following completes the next step of the chi-square goodness of fit test? So they're using a p-value of 0.01, right? So right off the bat, you know that, okay, we have to look for the critical value of 0.01. Now you have four outcomes, right? You have normalized normal body, normal ebony, purple normal, purple ebony, right? So you have four outcomes. So how many degrees of freedom? Three, Three right? And then the critical value for this, because you're going to go to 0.01, is... According to this is 11.34, and they have 11.35. All right, whatever. It's close enough. So right off, just looking at this, what two choices do we eliminate? Well, I'm just confused. Go ahead. Where did you say, wait, hold on. I don't know. Oh, that's because I'm not what I want. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's no, yeah, this isn't anything. This is just one I. Oh, because there's one in here. Okay. The number Does it look like that? Let me just see. This is normal eyes, normal body, normal eyes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Different numbers though, yeah. They use the same thing. No, they like to recycle. Yeah. Yeah. This is something. This is actually actually June had asked me about this like over the weekend, right? So yeah, so it's three degrees of freedom. Okay, and so the question is, okay, so now we know that it can't be this and it can't be this because oh, I'm sorry, it can't be A and it can't be C. Because both of those don't have the right number of degrees of freedom, right? Because it's 782 and we know it should be 11.35. So now the second question is, okay, well, they calculated the chi-square value. Is it 2.11 or 10.48? So how do you do that? So you don't want to do the whole chi-square thing for this, right? So the easiest thing to do is just pick, pick one of these. Pick the first one, 
and do a quick little O minus E and then square it and then multiply, divide it by E. So 187 minus 171, what does that come out to? Right? The difference is what? 16? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> right? Oh my God. 187 minus 171 is what? 16, right? Now square that. 16 squared is equal to? And don't guess it, just do the numbers, right? You got to calculate it. What is it? 256. 256? Okay. 256, right? And then we're going to divide that by what we originally expected, 171. All right, so what does that give you? 1.497. So 1.50, right? 1.49. So 1.50. So just this first one is equal to 1.5. This is 2.11. You still have to calculate the rest of these. So is that going to be greater than 2.11? Right. So just because you know that you're already at one and a half, there's no way that you're going to be under 2.11. This has to be, this one has to be the correct answer because that's probably going to get you to 10.48 because the rest of these have some pretty big number differences too. Okay. So that's a quick way of doing it. Instead of doing the whole thing, as soon as you do the first one, you realize, hey, this is 1.5. I know that this is going to exceed 2.11 if you add the rest of these up. Right? And so that's how you know that that's the correct one. Okay? Good. Jeff? Will they ever have the values like equal each other? Like 4.99, you do everything and you get like 4.9 for 5. Oh, for which one? For Would they ever keep it that close? Um, calculating the... Would they ever keep what? what say it again. I'm a little, so I guess the number that you calculated is really close to the... Uh, the expected number in the chart. Oh no, it's it's usually yeah, it's usually going to be significantly different. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, so that it wouldn't be exactly the same. Yeah, because if it's exactly the same, technically you're not supposed to accept it. Okay, it's got to be uh, less than but not equal to. And if it's equal to or greater than, then you generally say, all right, you hit the critical value, it's no longer valid. So it's definitely going to be significantly higher or lower than what you have. Yeah. Yep. All right. Do you guys see how that worked out? Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Um, so a couple of options we could do right now. We could do a couple more chi-square in the packet I gave you, or we can dump it if you feel good about it, and then we can jump onto some of the pedigree charts. I would rather do pedigree charts. Pedigrees? Some of the pedigree questions are really fun. Okay, so let's do, yeah, we could do that. That's fine. And then we can always double back to, to, to the um, chi-square if we need to which is fine. Okay. So let's look at those pedigrees. Okay. So if you guys at home, this is in the Mendelian genetics AP exam review right here. Okay. And then we'll do some of the free response too. Okay. Okay. So with the pedigree charts, the things that they're going to be asking you to figure out are number one, modes of inheritance. Is it autosomal? Is it X-linked or sex-linked? Or is it mitochondrial, right? So those are your three options. Is it on an autosome? Is it sex-linked or is it mitochondrial? Is it ever mitochondrial? Yes, I'm going to show you one where it was. Yeah, go ahead. Can you just go over exactly how the mitochondrial one works? What exactly is that? It's only inherited from the mother. So if the mother has a disease, she can only she passes it on to her offspring. And it, it's never inherited by the dad. Would it be both male and female? You'll see both males and females, right? But then what will happen is the dad won't ever pass it on. Regardless of if it's only, you know how the girls have two egg chromosomes? Yep. Is the mother both, in, like would both have to be affected or is it just... For like, mitochondrial, it's not even on an X chromosome. That's what I'm saying. Right. So you get it regardless right. of what X chromosome. Right. If the mom has it, you get the disease. Oh. Everybody gets it. Except for the dad. That would be the dad thing. would not be passing it on. So if dad has it and none of the children get it, then you know that it's mitochondrial. But you'll see, I'll show you. There's actually an example of it. It's like the only time I've ever seen it. So, <laughs> like, we got one question and that's it. So, all right. So, for this one here, um, your pedigrees, they, they'll sometimes set it up with the generation. So, like, this is generation one, here's two, three, and four, right? And in this one here, they gave you this disease, Friedrich's ataxia, which is a commercial curve, I think. Um, and it's caused by an insertion mutation in a non coding portion of this gene where you get a GAA triplet that's repeated hundreds of times, right? 
so you're adding this to the DNA. It's an insertion. So the, the gene's big, right? Um, and then it says it encodes a protein called for taxin, and this is the pedigree, right? So this is the first piece they show you, right? So you can kind of see from this. Um, let's actually let's talk about it. Um, can you determine if it's dominant or recessive by looking at this? You said it's recessive, right? What's the proof? What's the evidence that tells it's recessive? There are barely any. Say it again. I just said there are barely any yeah, First of all, you don't see a lot of people with it, so that tells you that's probably recessive, right? The other thing is look at the parents. If none of the parents have it, but then the offspring do, that tells you that those parents are carrying the allele, right? And that they're probably hybrids, and that that offspring has the two recessives, right? And then same thing here. They're hybrid, and then that's got the two recessives, right? Same thing with these two, okay? So that's one way to tell, okay? Um, and so there are really two ways to tell. Look at the parents and see what the offspring look like, and then also the number of individuals that have it. If it's pretty sparse, there's a good chance it's, it's recessive, right? And it's autosomal. Go ahead. Would it ask because if it, oh, so you just said autosomal. Right, yep. And it's an, on an autosome. How do you know it's not sex linked? Um, you would see males and females inheriting it at different rates. Um, you'd also be able to tell, like, okay, a, a male has it, the females have it, then none of the males have it. Like, if a male has it and it's a genetic disease, there's a better chance that the females are picking it up. And if the mom has it, all of her sons will have it. So if you have an affected female, like, let's say this was circled in, then all of the sons, like, this son would definitely have it. Because if a mom has a disease... She's got both affected X chromosomes. The kids, get, the boys are going to get an X that's affected. You know, either one's going to be affected. Okay. So then they gave you this other thing. They said, "Oh, let's collect the DNA, right?" And they did PCR, right? And they made a gel electrophoresis here. Okay. So I just want to show you this because this is kind of cool. This will help you guys with other questions. So this is the known fragment size, right? Just to give you like a size reference. But these are the individuals they took it from. So they took it from in. Generation three, they took it from numbers two, three, and four. So numbers two and three, they took it from them, right? And they took it from four, right? Now, two and three have a kid that actually has it, right? So what does that mean about two and three? If they have an offspring that has a recessive disease, what does it mean about both of their genotypes? They're hybrids, right? And look at this. They have two bars, right? So now one of them is the affected one, and one is the normal one. Now, remember, they said this ataxia, this disease, is based upon an insertion of several hundred nucleotides. So which of these represents the affected gene? The top one or the bottom one? Well, they both look like, from the one with three, like dash four, that one looks really like it has to do with the inheritance pattern, but for these two, we know that they're both hybrid, right? So which of these is the affected gene? And remember, the gene is based on an insertion. Go ahead, Christian. Which one? Yeah, this one? Yep, that's the affected one. This is normal, right? So what this means is that these two people have an affected gene, which is the bigger one because it's got that insertion in it. Right? It's got that extra sequence of hundreds of base pairs in it, and then that's the normal one. Okay, So two and three, those are the normal ones. Okay, uh, In generation three, individual four doesn't have it. Right, And what this tells you here is individual four has two of the normal traits. That's why that's a little bit thicker. Okay, So it has more DNA there. Go ahead, Chuck. The top one. And the reason why it's the top one is that's the bigger fragment because that has that extra set of repeats in it. Okay? So far, so good with that? Right? Down here, they don't have the extra repeats. The normal gene doesn't have that insertion. So it's smaller, so it can migrate faster. Right? A person who's, high, who's homozygous recessive, um, sorry, homozygous dominant, this is that person who's unaffected. A person who's affected by it has both of the extensions, so they only have one big blob at the top. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the person who's affected. In individual four, generation one, they have it. Okay, so if someone has it, you're going to see a, a thicker band at the top, meaning they have two extra 
pieces of DNA, they have two pieces of DNA fragment that have the insertion in there, right, with extra GAA repeats, okay? Good so far? And then the last picture here, this shows you what it actually looks like, right, which is a hot mess. So here's your sequence of DNA, and then that extra insertion is kind of folded on itself, and it does what's called triple stranding DNA. So you know that that's just, it's just a mess, right? Now you got three strands in there, you have all these extra sequences, right? And so that messes up the gene. Okay, so based on figure one, what is the inheritance pattern? And we kind of figured it out already, right? It's autosomal, right? And we said it's recessive, right? Okay. And then the second question, they said, okay, individual in generation three, number five, they said the probability that it will develop pre taxi is close to which following. So number three, five, this person. So what's the chance that they would develop it? So both of their parents are here. They know they have a kid that has it. So what does that mean about both parents? They're both heterozygous, right? So if you have two heterozygous parents, what's the probability of a child having it? 25%, right? So this will be 25%. Got it. Why, in this case, don't we combine that with the other person who has it see the probability of it? The reason for that is they're asking for just that individual. The probability that individual five will develop it, it's just that one person. For each individual, it's always the percent out of the Punnett square. Now, if they were to say, what's the probability? Let's say they, they said um, individuals three and four go on and have two more children. What's the probability that both children will have it? When they're including both, that's when you multiply the 0.25 times the 0.25, okay? And that will give you that percentage that both kids will have it, okay? Or that either kid will have it, okay? Because that means that now you're including both of those probabilities together. Each one of these is individual, right? So for individual five, they're just gonna be a 25% chance. But if you said, oh, they're going to have two more kids, what's the probability that both will have it? It's 0.25 times 0.25. Okay, question you just got? Yeah, yeah question. Okay. What's autosomal mean? It means it's not on a sex chromosome. So it's a regular chromosome. What, numbers 1 through 22 are the normal chromosomes. And then the 23rd pair is the sex chromosome. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at a different one. We got a... We're going to go, I think it's page, this one, yeah, we did that already. Oh, this one, yep, okay. So go to page 10, right, and you're going to see this pretty pretty uh, extensive Punnett square, not Punnett square, uh, pedigree chart, right? So right off the bat, you know they're going to ask you, okay, is it dominant or recessive? So, first of all, can we tell if it's dominant or recessive? It's dominant. How do you know? You're right. Because in the first generation, most of the kids have it from the dominant, from the homozygous and the heterozygous. Okay. So, first of all, you do see, you see a lot of dark circles there, right? So, that tells you that most of them have it, right? And actually, if you look at this, the majority of the offspring have it, right? Here's the other hint. Is there another spot where you can confirm it for certain that it's dominant? Got it. There's one spot I'm going to show you. Is it the bottom one? This one. Okay. See these two parents? They both have it. They have two offspring that don't have it. Right? So that tells you that it's dominant, right? And that you actually have offspring that don't have it. Is it what? Sex linked. It is sex linked. How can you tell? The uh, dad has it in the first one, and most of the girls have it in the second one. Right. So the dad has it here. Right, and then most of the girls have it. Actually, all the girls have it, right? Which means that the males are not inheriting anything from the mom, right? And then in this generation, mom and dad both have it, but notice that the two males don't have it, but the daughters do, okay? So that tells you that, okay, mom is a hybrid, right? And she gave one of her normal alleles to each of the sons. Do you guys see that? It's a little tricky, right? And the same thing is going on here. Dad has it, mom doesn't. All the daughters have it, 
the son doesn't, which means the son got his normal allele from the mom. Okay. So the question they have here is what describes the genotype of the individual identified with an asterisk here? So that individual, right, it's a female, okay, and she's got the disease, right? And it's dominant. So what does that mean? She has two X chromosomes, right? She inherited one of those from the dad. That is effective. Yeah, it's, it's C, one dominant and one recessive, right? And then the question they had here was, what describes the inheritance pattern? Now, as soon as you look at this and you say, okay, I know it's dominant, but now it says it's autosomal recessive. You know right off the bat, okay, A is out of the question. So even if you didn't figure that, and this is actually what happened, because we were going through this, and I, you know, I don't look at these beforehand. I just, I like to do it with you guys. Um, and so right off the bat, we're like, wait a minute. There's no autosomal dominant here. And they're like, wait a minute, X-linked dominant. Let's go back and look. And this is the only one that makes sense. It's X-linked dominant, right? Because you can see that the inheritance is, is being passed on um, sex-linked because males are affected, are not affected when the mom doesn't have it, and vice versa, okay? Are we all right with it? Okay, and then the question we had was, how do you tell mitochondrial? So we scroll down, and this is an example of mitochondrial inheritance. Right? Here's how you can tell. Mom has a disease, right? If she passes it on to the males, notice that wherever a male has a disease, none of the offspring have it, which means the male is not passing it on. Okay? So whether this is a dominant or a recessive, it doesn't matter. The fact that the male has it and none of the offspring have it here, but the female has it, all of her offspring have it. And if you look up here, the mom has it, every single kid has the disease. So if you see something like that where the mom has it and then every kid gets it, it's mitochondrial, right? Because this is showing that only the mother is passing it on. And the evidence that shows that dad doesn't pass it on is in the case here, these two squares where the dad has it here and here, none of the offspring have it. That tells you it's mitochondrial, okay? Because if you think about it, um, if this was a recessive allele, right? I mean, you could say, okay, this is recessive, this is dominant, both of them have it. But if this is recessive, this is dominant, none of them have it, that works too. Okay, but the fact that all the offspring have it, that's telling you it's mitochondrial. Okay. All right. And that's actually what they were asking. They said the condition, and then again, when you look at your, now here's the other thing too. They also give you answer choices that kind of force your hand, right? Because when you look at this, it's not random, right? It's definitely, there's a pattern here, right? So it's not random. We know it's not passed from fathers to son via a Y, because if the dad has it, the sons don't get it, right? So we know it's not that. Um, it's passed from the mothers to son through an X-linked gene. Well, if the mom has it, son gets it but so does the so does the daughter right and so it has to be mothers to awesome view mitochondrial that's mitochondrial lab got it and the other thing that tells you it's not sex linked if the mother has it and the daughter has it that means that the daughter had to get one of the other alleles from the dad. So the fact that mom has the disease, dad doesn't, and then the daughter gets it, means that she's getting, she's not getting it from the dad, so she's getting this inheritance from the mom. Okay. Got it? We're good? Okay. Um what what causes this? You have an extra chromosome. What process triggers you had to have a third copy of a chromosome in meiosis? Yeah, yeah non-disjunction, right? So the failure of the chromosomes to separate. So uh, this represents a result of non-disjunction during gamete formation. 
That's when the chromosomes fail to separate during meiosis. And you get an extra chromosome. Usually you get trisomies out of it, like trisomy 23, trisomy 21, uh, 23. <laughs> Trisomy 21, trisomy 17, trisomy 18, or you get extra um, the X and Y chromosomes. Um, yeah, you know what? I want to do a couple of the. We'll come back to these because these are some kind of cool ones. What is this? X and Y chromosomes during meiosis one and two. Okay. If normal spermatogenesis is, is disrupted, the gametes can have different chromosomes than expected. Which of the following was most likely cause of one of the four gametes having two X chromosomes? Oh, so if you have two X's instead of one, you're having extra chromosomes. It's going to be non disjunction of the X. Because you're going to have two X's and neither an X or a Y. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is that it? Oh, here's another one. Let's see. Based on this pedigree, what's the pattern of inheritance? So, male has it, female gets it, female doesn't have it. Nobody has it, and the female suddenly gets it. Female has it, male doesn't. Okay, so could this be sex linked? No, right, because right here, if the mom has it, the dad doesn't, but the daughter gets it. Well, if the daughter's getting the disease, then it's, the dad has to have it if, he's, if it's sex linked, so it's not. Right? So, what are you thinking? Let's see the choices. <laughs> It says autosomal recessive goes between one and two. You get an affected offspring. Yeah, no one has it, then it pops up. That's recessive. They have it. Some do, some don't. So this could be dominant and homozygous recessive. So these guys could be okay. And the same thing here. These two don't have it, and then it pops up. So between one and two and five and six, that tells you that it's. Uh, Yeah, it's yep, it's B. Yep, autosomal recessive. Yep. Okay. Right. Go ahead. Actually, back up. I assume they were probably trying to like do this as like a trick, but um, three and four when a male is affected, uh -huh. the female is the only one who's affected. Is that supposed to be like almost like a red herring? Yeah, that could be. Yeah, yeah. Because over here, the female's affected, right? The male isn't, and then all of a sudden this one has it. You know it can't be sex linked because the male would have to pass on a trait here. So that, that eliminates any type of X linked inheritance, right? And the fact that they don't have it and they don't have it, but they have offspring that do, that tells you that it has to be recessive. Because if, it, if it's not appearing, then it does. Yeah, like in this case here, it's a recessive with a this is a hybrid. And this results in little a little a here. That's almost like it's recessive. So yeah, that's that's how that one's set up. Yeah. But it's not sex linked because of this right here. And also here, well, because the, this could she could pass it on here. But the fact that you have a, when you have an affected female and a non-affected male, and the female offspring has it, they have to get one X from mom, one X from dad. So that's why it eliminates that. Okay. okay. Is that good? All right. Um, I want to do these. I want to do these tomorrow because we're getting kind of getting kind of to the end here. Uh, oh, see, here's another one, right? Five square, right? You get these flowers and observed and expected. So, critical value is 0.05, two degrees of freedom. Uh, they even tell you that it's 5.99. Um, what if the statements completes the student's goodness of fit test? So. They got the critical value, the critical value and two degrees of freedom is 599, right? And, oh, look at that.
So the calculated chi-square is 1.53 and can be rejected. So what are they doing here? You got some big differences here. So the critical value is this, and they want to know what's the goodness of fit test. Did I miss something? Red and white. Yeah. So they want to know the calculated chi-square. So again, do a quick math equation here. 64 and 56, the difference is, what is that one? Right. And the null hypothesis cannot be, can be. You would reject it. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, no, they didn't count. I'm sorry. Yeah, cannot be. Because you have a lower value. Chi square is 1.53, so it's low. So you're below that. So then you accept the, the null hypothesis. Yep. Oh, this is a nasty one. All right, we'll do that. A researcher crosses two organisms that are heterozygous for three unlinked traits, right? And it's X, X, Y, Y, Z, Z. Which of the following is a fraction of offspring that are predicted to have X, X, Y, Y, Z, Z, right? So if you take two hybrids, right, what's the chance that these offspring are going to have that? So a little probability there. So the chance of having this is... 25%, 25%, 25%, right? You multiply those together, and that should give you the number. The belief, right? Because getting little x, little x, little y, little y, little z, little z, these are hybrids, so to get your recessive is 25% for each one. So, yeah, yep. So... Can you just simplify this and make a square of two heterozygous and then find our from that? Yeah, I think you can because what you yeah because you wind up with is each one of those to get this is a is a quarter. Yep. It would be 0.25 times 0.25 times 0.25. Yep. Yep, which is A, 164. Yeah, yep. And you basically get decimal and just divide these and you get what you have. Yep. And we just did this one. This is another one. Oh, this is a repeat. Right. If you have a chi-square value of 92.86 and have a critical value of 7.82, what does that tell you? So if you, your chi-square is 92.86 and your critical value is 7.8, you exceeded your critical value like ridiculously, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it happens, <laughs> right? So something was going on here. Look at this. Like something happened with having the two recessives. Right? You expected this, you got way more. Um, so their numbers were off, their prediction was wrong. You know, there was something wrong with their prediction because everything else seemed to be okay. Right? Uh, so you have to reject the null, right? Um, and it's definitely not independent assortment. There's probably gene linkage going on there, right? Because they, they expected it to independently assort. Yeah. How do you get that exact ratio though? Like, one of them being, um, like, the first one's so much bigger than all the other ones, which are all kind of the same. Yeah. This one isn't a look. See, 82. You talking about this way or this oh, no, way? No, no. Oh, yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah. They predicted that it would have been. Um, yeah, they, they predicted that they were going to get like these equal numbers in the middle here, which shows their crossovers, but this is like way off. Yeah. Like, how yeah. Your bottom one is so, so low? Yeah. yeah. I know. No, no, no. So, like, yeah. The bottom one is so close to the middle. 
Oh, yeah. 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 It's like random. Yeah. You know what? It, it, it means something's going on. <laughs> when you get that much of an extreme, it means that there's definitely an alternative hypothesis. So I don't know if that was an actual exam question. I have to look and see because I can go back and see like they flag them as either as exam questions or this was like one of these like formative things where it's like, oh, you know, it's a made up question just to let people see how it goes. Yeah. They were trying to do a 9331. Right. I think that, yeah, actually, that's what they were trying to do, 9331. Yep. So it's not independent assortment. Well, actually, they observed this. This is what they got. So it's actually showing that the gene is linked and it's not independently assorted. Because this would be independently assorting. This shows that it's actually linkage. Would it be C or D? It's, uh, it's going to be. Uh, uh, D, because this would be independent assortment nine three three one. This is showing it's, it's a link gene somewhere. Yeah, it's just these numbers are higher. Like these are your crossovers here, I believe. I have to look at the question and see. I didn't. I, I should have read the question better, but I didn't. But I believe these are your. This is your dominant. That's your recessive, and then these are the combinations of the whole. Yeah. All right. So tomorrow, what we'll do is a few more of these. Um, we'll do some pre response questions. We'll do the last ones, which give you some kinds of like <coughs> similarities to this. And then uh, we'll wrap up on Wednesday with, I'm sorry, on Thursday with some Hardy Weinberg. We'll do Hardy Weinberg and a couple more of them. All right.